BBC Radio One Extras, Reese Parkinson here. We have uh, not only an amazing ping pong player, but also a fantastic documentary maker. Uh, it's Louis Theroux on the show. Thanks for coming. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Nice so to be here. you're quite busy. Well, I have am. been busy. Yeah, I have been a bit busy. Yeah. With work and life, I've got three kids. I'm always busy. But I've got a series coming up. It's coming on uh, Sunday, BBC Two, nine o'clock. So that's mainly what I'm busy with. Yeah, well, three kids and three new docs yeah. coming out. Yeah, and the I'm first all about one. threes. You love a three, don't you? It's a lucky yeah. number. <laughs> but um, the the first doc that's coming out is is on polyamory. Yeah. Now, for those that are listening, are like, what is What's that? that? What is that? It's ethical non monogamy, and I think the younger people probably are more au fait with it than older people. It's basically when you're not in just a committed relationship with one person, but maybe with two or several, and they all know about each other and they're all fine with it. And so, I don't know, like, there's different ways of looking at it, but as an older person myself, I think it's partly about older couples spicing up their lives and saying, do you know what? I've fallen in love with someone else, but I haven't fallen out of love with my wife or husband. Let's see if we can make this work. But isn't that called cheating? No, because everyone knows about it. It's all out in the open. So everyone's friends, everyone knows each other, and everyone's signed up to it. So, for example, if I was married, and I hope to be one yeah. day, and if my wife was like, okay, I want like a partner, yes. and I'd know that she was having sex with... Uh, yeah, basically after a few years, maybe, let's say 10 or 15 years down the road, it wouldn't have to be, but you still love each other, but you've settled into a sort of bit of a routine and then she gets feelings for someone else at work, let's say. Now, the normal way of doing things would either be she ignores it, bottles it up and says, do you know what, I've just got to make it work with Reese and carry on as is. Or she would cheat and go off and illicitly pursue a hot, steamy affair. Now, this is a way of saying, like, let's have... The, the sort of for all the feelings of the romance actually pursue the relationship but with your consent you say like do it and I'll I'll be doing the same so everyone's on the same page that, that everyone can pursue the relationship that they want to while still being committed to their existing partner okay right it sounds like let's say you're for this but it sounds what would you like well, going there's a into part this? of it that makes sense clearly you know what one of the things that struck me when I was approaching this story was I at the turn of the previous century, in 1900s, in the UK, the average age that men died at was 48. That's how old I am. I'm 48. We've got these, we lead these long lives now. Marriage evolved as an institution at a time when people just didn't live that long. So you, they weren't, they didn't, marriage didn't start like, this would be a great way for, for people to live for, for sort of 70 or 80 years. And so the, that part of it, I do actually understand. The trouble is, like everything, there is a downside, which is, sexual jealousy, which the people in polyamory claim is a, what they call it, a secondary emotion. They say, like, actually, that's about anxiety and insecurity. You don't, th that's not intrinsic. I disagree with that. I think, actually, sexual jealousy is something quite primal and real. So, I th and I saw it with my own eyes. I saw people being upset by, in polyamory, people being upset by their partners getting into new relationships. Well, this was it. There's Heidi and Jerry in the dark. Yeah. Now, they're a part of this and does Jerry at some point feel does, does it get to a bit where you kind of notice he was like actually he might be jealous here or he might be feeling well, I think Jerry way. wasn't jealous but he was well I think he was he admitted he'd had feelings of jealousy but he also had feelings of loneliness and what I saw in Heidi and Jerry who'd been married for 16 years she had then struck up a relationship and for five years several you know at least a couple of times a week she'd go off with Joe this other guy now, with Joe and Heidi, they clearly had a very full, physical, exciting life, you know, in the full sense of the word. They loved being around each other. They loved sleeping together. The relationship between Heidi and her husband, Jerry, felt quite different. And I don't even know if they had a significant physical dimension. So I think Jerry, and Jerry wasn't pursuing any other relationship. So I saw Jerry and thought, wow, you have seemed a bit lost and lonely. And I can see how... Um, I had to. I sort of struggled almost with feelings of pr being protective and f or feeling almost a bit annoyed at Heidi that she was having so much fun with Joe while Jerry was sitting at home playing on his computer. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but at the same time, he said like, he's fine with it and that he likes seeing Heidi happy. happy. They've got oh. a word compersion, 
which uh, is a made-up word they use to describe the pleasure that you get from seeing your loved one um, happy, fulfilled romantically in another relationship. I think a lot of people listening to the show right now, they go, well, Jerry, why don't you just leave? Right, but here's the thing. Jerry's quite overweight and he doesn't keep, keep himself in shape. He's not got the most vivacious personality. On the, on the open uh, market of romance, <laughs> he's going to struggle, I think. Okay. You know, as an older guy. And um, so I don't think he's going to... It's not like he can leave the relationship and he'll be flooded with offers. Yeah. He might just be lonely <laughs> on his own in a little room yeah. away from his daughter and his wife. Whereas now at least he can be lonely with his uh, daughter and his wife around him. That's fair. Some yeah, of the time. I you know what I mean? He's not yeah, yeah. He's not really drowning in good options. He's, yeah. sort of, he's not Clooney. No, you know? he's not Clooney. So when, when you was doing this, obviously, you know, something that I guess is quite close to home because you are a married man. So yeah. when you talk to your wife, I'm like, well, we're planning on doing this in documentary. Yeah. You, how, how was she? Could you actually get involved? At some, I mean, <laughs> a lot of people would be yeah. very thrilled to see you at your top off on your knees and a dog. Well, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, how was that? And, wear, and wearing an eye mask and being fed is a sensual eating workshop. You know, back in the day, it's 20 <laughs> years this year that I started on Weird Weekends, which was the first series I did on, on TV and actually was all about participation in odd worlds and and unusual subcultures. And I always used to try and get involved. That was one of the um, the techniques of my journalism. It got role in a porn film in one or whatever it was, I'd, I'd try and just sort of roll up my sleeves a little bit and get stuck in. And um, so for this one, because it was a a slightly lighter subject than some of the recent ones I've done, I felt, well, I'll try and be a little bit, if not polyamorous, at least a little bit more immersed in that world. But of course, I needed to get a sign-off from my wife. My (laughs) wife happens to be an extremely um, understanding person <laughs> and she uh she was she was fine with it and then i of course although i don't to be honest with you i didn't really know what was i was told yeah, I, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. actually more full-on than i expected yeah. i thought it was going to be close your eyes and eat a strawberry Ooh, is that delicious <laughs> and actually all the women had their tops off and the men were sort of rubbing their bodies on me as well and i was not wearing a, i was sort of topless and then and then a woman was going around um uh, uh, squirting whipped cream onto her breasts. I, I think I can say that on Radio One Extra. And yeah, feeding yeah. Um, cream from her breasts to some of the other people present while they were had their blinds on. Now that didn't happen to me. I'm pretty sure it didn't. I had an eye mask on, but uh, I, and I didn't check the rushes. But uh, I, I don't think it happened. But I showed the sequence. We edited it very delicately, and then I showed it to my to my wife the finished program and said like are you okay with this and actually on her advice I took out she said like well I'm fine with it but you've also got to think about the grannies like my mum and her mum yeah of course and so there were two shots that I said she she suggested like take another look at those because it looked like a woman was licking my chest and she wasn't she was just blowing on my chest Mm. totally Um, different thing massive difference (laughs) Um, but um, like you were saying you you do get stuck in when you do these. Dogs. I try You've done to it for years. And yeah. Something else that's really good is you always seem to ask the questions that we're sitting at home watching and we're like, please ask that, and you always do. Is there a part of you that's like, I know I'm going to do this when I go into this, or are you kind of fearless with your questioning? Um, you know, I just I'm aware that I'm there to get the story, and um, if it if it's a case of I I find that you know a lot of these stories involve controversial or weird, for want of a better term, uh, ways of life. But you find that really, and there's there's almost always this sort of contradiction or there's an elephant in the room to do with like, well, you know, in polyamory, don't you um, get feelings of jealousy when you're, you see that your wife's just enjoyed, you know, intimate encounters with some mm. other person. And I think by and large, not always, the people feel they're okay. They know what they've signed on for. They're okay with answering tough questions. And in some ways, I think sometimes it's a relief for them to sort of get it out of the way. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. To express whatever contradiction or strange dissonance they feel. Maybe a good example as well was when, you you know, obviously in the doc you did with the Nazis mm. and then when they were kind of threatening you, you know, seeing if you were Jewish. Right. Yeah, and you're still having to 
do the dock and ask those questions. That's right. I'm not sure you did have a team of bodyguards behind no. you, behind camera when you're doing that. That's right. So maybe th that example, like how's that when you're doing it? Are you a bit... You that know, can be nerve-wracking, you know, and sometimes you're aware that you've asked, you're asking a question that might step on some toes and a very occasionally... Um, you know, either by choice or inadvertently, you find that you've provoked someone and they go off the deep end and shout, which I don't actually enjoy. Like, I'm not someone who enjoys conflict. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of person who walks into a, sh a shop and ends up buying things I don't really want because I somehow a salesperson has made it awkward for me to say no. And I think, well, I'd better just buy it because otherwise it'll be embarrassing. Like a Louis Theroux hat. Yeah, example, like a yeah. Louis Theroux yeah. hat. And I'd be like, why would I need one of those? I am Louis Theroux. And they'd be like, and it's only £10.50. You're like, oh, I guess they better buy it because they think I'm going to buy it. So, um, I, I, so I, I don't look, seek confrontation, but actually sometimes you actually have to, you have to go there. You have to take the conversation to an uncomfortable place. And I don't feel like on this show, that on One Extra Talks that we've done before, that there's been a time where I've really... There's been times where I've disagreed with what people were saying, but I've I've felt the need to kind of interrupt the conversation and, and go against that. But mm -hmm. is there any, when you've done a doc, that it's personally affected you? Like, it's going to out against that, my against my belief, I'm going to challenge you. Well, yeah, of course. And actually, you know, I've made programmes, as you said, about neo-Nazis also... Um, the Westboro Baptist Church, which is a homophobic ministry in America. I've made programs where people do things that I'm deeply opposed to, and I express that. But you can express that in, in a way that isn't, um, you know, those guys know that I'm not a neo-Nazi. You know, it's not a shock to them if I say, like, I find that offensive and wrong and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I said to the Westboro Baptist Church in one of the opening scenes, like, I support gay rights. Like, I support the free expression of one's gender and one's sexual orientation. And, um, they, you know, the interview didn't derail at that point. They, they know that, they, that they're out on a limb. Okay. And, and with, with the dogs, you, you know, all the, all the ones you've mentioned there, in a sense, although a lot of the people might disagree with who you're kind of interviewing completely, but it is giving them a platform at mm -hmm. the same time, especially yeah. with somebody on BBC Two, you, you've done them for BBC, and yeah. they're a louder voice. Yeah, by is, millions, and millions of people see them. Now, is there any that you wouldn't want to ever give a voice to? Um... I think it, it's hard to say in the abstract. I think you have to, yes, is, but probably yes. And actually, it's a case of, is the story important enough? And do, do we feel as program makers that we are able to um, contextualise or undermine or bring light to a subject in such a way that um, it's being aired responsibly. You know, the Westboro Baptist Church is an interesting one. I'm very proud of that program. I think there are people out there who probably feel we gave them um, the oxygen of publicity, but I think m millions of people will have seen that and been um, shocked and and it would have helped people to understand the, the, the poisonous way in which indoctrination works. At the same time, I know that at least one person watched it and went and joined. You know, someone yeah, yeah, watched that yeah. program and literally and agree, went yeah, yeah. And, and joined up and married one of the women who we'd featured in the program, an English guy from wherever. You know, I made one about a mega jail in in Miami, featured a charismatic young guy who was accused of three murders called Robert Shaw. And a woman in Birmingham saw that and thought, oh, he's quite hunky, began writing to him and is, is to this day, I believe, remains in a relationship with him. They speak every day. I don't think they're married, but they are romantically involved. Wow. Do you, do some of the people get attached to you as well? To me, the like, people you, in the programmes? Yeah. Are you I, in conversation with any? I'm not corresponding with anyone on death row. I mean, uh, I like, you know, I think the, there's a bonding process that takes place so that you try and build, the trust. Yeah, you try and build the, rapport and that, that 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 has to be really has to be based on something real, and so there's a part of you that grows to like. Uh, in most cases, grows to like the people that you feature on the programs, even when they're involved in um, worldviews that can be dangerous or 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 you know deeply poisonous. And so, you know, it's, it's something I grapple with a lot. It's like how can you like someone who's done something dreadful or can you like someone who's involved in a way of life that's bigoted and hateful? And the fact is it is it 
it's I mean yes I can it seems that I can yeah. but you just have to separate liking someone from agreeing with them and with the new docs you're doing it's such a vast range different different topic each doc but um at the start of your career was you going into these meetings with the BBC bosses and they were telling you Louis you're going to do this that and that and now is it you coming to them saying I want to do it hasn't you know I was I've been very lucky in how I got into TV I was um I was on a show called Michael Moore's TV Nation. Michael Moore, the documentary maker, hired me. I had no experience. He put me on TV. So in a weird way, um, I was never accountable directly to the BBC. Like I got my job through Michael Moore and he kept me on the programme for, for two seasons. Then after that, I came up with my ideas. I was signed to a development deal and Weird Weekends was one of the ideas. And it was always me um, driving the, the editorial agenda. Occasionally, they'd say, no, that's a stupid idea. It was filtered through the exec executive producer or the series producer. So they might say, that's not such a good idea. But, but by and large, from the get-go, I've been able to more or less choose my stories and my okay. way of doing things. Amazing. And it seems you've become, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a bit of a cult hero. Like, well, that's nice of you to say. I was on the one show last night and they had the Louis Through Appreciation Society on, which was a new one on me. So that's nice to hear that. I'm just grateful that there's people out there who enjoy the shows. And are you kind of happy that people make t-shirts and hats yeah. and tattoos as well of your face on their bodies? Yeah, no, I, of course. It's, it feels very complimentary. And um, I, uh, you know, I often think about whether I should buy one for my wife. Uh, <laughs> Do you know, and then I think, oh, is that weird? I don't even know. You know what I, I mean? mean? I, I don't think I could wear one myself. It could Maybe add, I could, I could try. It might seem a bit... It could add the spice into the Don't you remember like bands when you were growing up and you saw someone in a band and they'd have their own band on their T-shirt? I can't remember who, like, I remember seeing that once. I don't think it was The Clash, but let's say it was like the drummer of The Clash wearing a Clash T-shirt. You just think, no, that's not right. <laughs> You're not supposed to wear your own band T-shirt. No, so you won't be wearing a shirt. No. Um, so... Obviously, you spoke about the weird weekends, Doc Steve, at yeah. the start. Now, one of them was the gangster rap episode. Yes. And um, I don't suppose you remember your rap by chance. Um, I'm afraid I do. I got to make this money. I, that was the I got to make. That was the chorus. But the actual rap started. Um, my money don't jiggle, jiggle. It folds. I like to see you wiggle, wiggle for sure. It makes me want to dribble, dribble. You know, riding in my Fiat. You really have to see it. Six feet two in a compact. No slack, but luckily the seats go back. I got a knack to relax in my mind. I'm feeling fine and I'm sipping on red, red wine. Right. There you go. I mean, how about that? I can. I um, drilled into my. I, I mean, I wish I could forget it. Now, talking... but it's like any great lyrics. Like ask Eric B, ask Jay Z. You just once you've come up with immortal verse, then it just stays with they you. They last forever. Yeah. <laughs> now, talking about rap, it's obviously one extra. I said Eric B, and um, he was a DJ. I meant Rakim. Rakim, yeah. Um, but you know, talking about rap, we, we've got some tracks here that we play on one extra a lot, yeah. and I'd love for you to maybe review some of them. Go on. Because I feel like the artist... I've got a good really ear, but that. I've actually got a good ear. I'm not musical, as in I can't really carry a tune. I'm not good at the guitar, but I think I've got a good ear for, for a hit. Okay. Um, well, this is an artist called Dave, Fritchie and Fredo. Have you heard of them too? Dave? Dave. That's his name. He could do better than that. Dave. Is that all it is? Dave? Just Dave. Wow. That's quite brave, isn't it? Brave Dave. And featuring... Fredo. Yeah, not sure. I'm not familiar with the oeuvre. Yeah. Um, this is called Funky Friday. Give this a listen. One six game. At this age, how are them man still hating? My young boy in a different country, but he ain't never been on vacation. One hand on a girl I'm dating, one hand on the cash I'm making. We come through like Funky Friday and have all your man them skating. I Came in 550 on trainers. I look girl amazing. Could be Bayesian, Trini, or Haitian. She got a bag with flowers. If the trainers match, I'll take it. Me and bro just shut down Gucci. Had the whole of the shop floor waiting. Oh, yeah, I like that. What does he mean he shut down Gucci, had the whole of the fl shop floor waiting? As in, like, he went in there, they had to close it because everyone's standing outside. Like, oh, my God, it's Dave. Then he bought everything so no one could buy anything else. I don't like, like, the idea, like, we had made everyone had to wait, like, taking pleasure from other people being inconvenienced. <laughs> but other than that, I thought it was excellent. <laughs> you know, you don't boast about, like, I've caused major delays. 
by my shopping practices, like traffic jams and people were late for their appointments. <laughs> I cut that bit, but other than that, excellent. Number one. Is it? Yeah. In what one. country? UK. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is Unknown T. And uh, the track They're is number called... number one right now. Number one. Really? In the UK. That's a good... That's, I liked it. Unknown T. This is called Hummer and B. This is the record of the streets right now. Unknown T, Hummer and B, I got galley on me, off block belly on me, panic and dash, them boy run and retreat. It's unknown T, Hummer and B, Gally on me, belly on me, panic and dash. We rise in batches, clap, clap, pull up, skirt, reverse. The mints go back in a jacket. Hope the bling on my ring make him backflip when it comes to the rap. All my brothers work off the magic. With a ten out of ten and it's banging a puff in the tragics. Listen, I was on a back row picking my cats. Night trap suit and I trap star hat. Goes, goes, moves, then come back. Her d's went up when she saw my stack. Pull up, pull up with Iz or Jeff. When I go home, till that girl go cap. How could you make that your darling one with a Barbie's looking like brats? And how could you make that your hubby empty tummy? That better he trash. Went on a mill, then dash. Listen, look. Baby, bend your back and then dig it, dig it Bend your back and then dig it, back and then dig it Girl, one more digging, back in one minute Back up, that's finished Wow, that's hot I mean That's great Is that in the charts? I think, I'm should not be. sure if it went off for you It's it got be? that uh, slightly scary, murky quality, doesn't it? Yeah, agreed It was intense I couldn't understand what they were talking about It sounded like there might be some African speaking at the end yeah with some the, African um, like, I don't know I just I want that, that's embarrassing if you were speaking in English and I didn't understand <laughs> <laughs> please tell me that was a different language at the end there I was going to say Caribbean influence as well Ben you're back yeah. in the yeah East, and was he talking about Homerton Homerton yeah is that well, where he's from it's a place yeah well I know it's a place God. Yeah, I'm <laughs> from London I am from London right last one this is what a was that one called oh it's called Homerton B it was yeah. he the artist or that the track Unknown T is the artist and the wow. track was called Homerton B they're all on yeah. I just they're all on the computer now you're not meant to look at that <laughs> <you're interesting. laughs> uh, right this is, uh, this is I, I think I know this one is this No Better by Heady One? Oh my <laughs> yes it is <laughs> with RV as well yeah yeah that one Man, be on the knees, you really think I went up C4 scrum? Like, no, no, shh. I could have laid in the uni room, but I know better. Boss wanna see me get nicked with a shh, but I know better. Next day, shh, got got back. Oh. Don't got to this week, that shh. And shh, they should know better. Don't see me in the flesh and don't make my look. Man, do for the grab and tweet, man, that shh and ski. How many? Shh, 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 shh. Let's see. Man could have pulled it on the net when done up, shh. And the bros didn't leave one. Man just left it to the media. They say I took an L and L, but sh made a W. Like w. Like you know what that needed was someone going <laughs> over the top. That's just it. Just was missing that. Was it? What do you start? Do you like people going? Skrr. I'm. Are you I mean, over that now? When it's in America, it's all right. But if it's in kind of UK doing a skrr, <laughs> I don't know if it. I don't know if it works. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's some things. I like an onomatopoeia, like noise. Splish. <laughs> Splish is uh, my favourite, of course. Yeah. It's Louis so random. Theroux. I mean, thanks so much for, no, I enjoyed for talking that. to us. Thank you. For that. Those, I enjoyed those. Thanks for introducing me to some new music. Yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll send it over to you. Perfect. Yeah. Look out for it. <laughs>